encouraging. Yeah. Very yeah. Very <laughs> You didn't say, now for your presentation, you know what you had to do. Let's take out those heaven outs. I've had a conversation. Something horror would do. I'd like to call the Peoria Public Schools District 150 Board of Education Committee of the whole meeting for March 24th, 2014 to order. Would you please call the roll? Here. 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 Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First we have awards and recognitions. Dr. Latham. Hi, if Mr. Howells would come up and recognize our all-state musicians. Good evening. In January, several District 150 students from Peoria High School and Richwoods High School, along with top student performers from all over the state, participated in the Illinois Music Educators Association Conference right here in Peoria. The conference itself hosts music educators from all over the state, provides excellent professional development on current topics in music education, and showcases the state's best student musicians and culminating concerts at the end of the conference. Being selected to participate in one of the groups, whether it's an honors group or an all-state group, is certainly one of the more rewarding experiences a young musician can have, and they most certainly deserve the recognition they are receiving here tonight. Before all the honors and accolades of such an achievement are realized, though, come hours of practice and preparation. The students that will be recognized here in a few moments have worked very hard to achieve what they have, and the complete product of that work didn't necessarily end on the stage in January. It continues today and will continue through their adult lives. Hard work, determination, perseverance, cooperation, and many other characteristics and skills which music education provides outside of its own academic rigors will set them up for success outside of the walls of their respective high schools. I'd like to thank the families of these students for your continued support. 
From hearing the strains of Merrily We Roll Along and Go Tell Aunt Rhody as beginning students, to listening to them practice ILMEA scales and difficult efforts that got them to where they are today, I thank you. I'd also like to thank the directors that are here and directors that gave them the foundation to be successful as they started down the path that led them to where they are now and where they will continue to go. Your continued hard work and enthusiasm will to help shape wonderful musicians and people for years to come. I'd also like to thank the Board of Education, District Administration, the Peoria Federation of Teachers, and all other district staff for your continued support of the fine arts in our district. Thank you all for understanding both the tangible and intangible qualities that fine arts education brings to our students and to our community. I'd like to now bring up our high school directors, Jason Warner, Simon Webb, Todd Schiefling, and Camilla Russell. They're going to recognize our students that participated in the ILMEA conference. Good evening. My name is Jason Warner. I'm a proud teacher at Peoria High School and the director of orchestras and music and also the lead teacher for the Preparatory School for the Arts. I'm proud to present Carrie Conton. Carrie is one of only two sophomores in our district who was selected for state. Carrie is also here with her mother, Sonia, her grandmother, her grandfather, her brother, and also our principal, Mr. Elliott, is here this evening. Carrie Conton. Could I ask what is her specialty? Violin. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm here to represent Trayvon Cooper. He was ill today from school, so he wasn't here, but he, is a, he was a vocalist, tenor, and he's also a part of the Bradley Honors Choir as well. My name is Todd Schiefling, and I'm the orchestra director at Richwoods High School. I have five of my orchestra students were selected for the All-State Orchestra, and I would like to recognize them at this time. Ashley Silver. Ashley is a sophomore who plays the cello, and Ashley is accompanied here this evening by her parents, Ronald and Cindy Silver. Also, Rafael Vidal. Rafael is a junior. He also plays the cello, uh, and he is represented here this evening by his parents, Bear and Marta Vidal. <laughs> I have three students that are not able to attend tonight's recognition. Their names are LJ Alexander Strong, who plays violin. Anna Liu, who plays viola, and Brian Giesing, who plays cello. We're very proud of them as well, and I will extend your congratulations when I see them tomorrow. I'm Camilla Russell, and I'm the choral director at Richwoods High School. The first person I would like to recognize is Bria Farron. Bria could not be with us this evening because she has a job, and she has to work. <laughs> very responsible young lady. Um, she's the daughter of Peter and Gina Farron, and she was a member of the All-State Choir singing the alto two part. The next person I would like to recognize is Noah Kinnear. Noah is quite a special young man. He was selected his junior year as well, and now his senior year, he was selected to the Honors All-State Choir, singing tenor two. He also won the Young Artist Competition and uh, was singing with the Peoria Area Civic Chorale at their Christmas concert, wasn't that correct? He's also um, been selected to uh, sing with the Bradley Honors Choir as well. So Noah Kinnear, he's the son of Michelle and Patrick Kinnear. Last, but certainly not least, we have Kripa Gua. And Kripa is a junior, and she was selected as a soprano too. And Kripa is here tonight with her mother, Miyakshi Ayer. How'd I do? OK. <laughs> and her father, Shashadri Gua. Um, Kripa, again, uh, she's a she does band and she does chorus, so we kind of we kind of share 
each other, which is really nice because we have such wonderful colleagues to work with that we share our students so that we have well-rounded musicians. And uh, Kripa, she'll make it next year, I'm sure, too. So I would like to thank you. It's really quite an accomplishment to uh, reach that level in the state competition. That's really tremendous, and congratulations to all of you for that. That's that's really something you should be proud of. That uh, anything else in words recognition, Ms. Wolfmeyer. I just want to take a minute to say congratulations. Also, my youngest son was uh, very active in the choral uh, community at Woodruff when he was in high school, and I. He had many friends, but I will tell you, the music group of kids is a very, very special group. And his lifelong friends came out of that group. And he continued with the, the choral when he went to Monmouth College. So he um, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. I was going to say the same thing. My friends who are still my friends from high school are all my band and orchestra friends. So yes, I, I don't think I ever made it to state. but. <laughs> the, you know, it is both the music and the friendships you make last forever, but the music is also a gift that stays with you forever and is, you know, a wonderful thing that we have and I hope we can keep supporting and expanding our arts because it's really important for you guys to get be able to do that in school. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. Lathan, any other awards or recognitions tonight? Okay, thank you. Next, our announcements. Any announcements? I uh, just want to announce that our first annual uh, WCTC hair show will be on um, April 12th, Saturday, April 12th at 4 o'clock. Uh, the students, uh, the construction trade students are participating. They're building the stage. And then we also have our uh, cosmetology, natural hair care, and barbering students participating. So it was a, a total package uh, with the students at Woodruff uh, creating the show for uh, Saturday, April 12th at 4 o'clock. At Woodruff. At Woodruff. Crawford. Uh, been made aware here of the Spring PFT Chess Tournament, also held on April 12th at 8 a.m. at Washington Gifted. Uh, I know that this is a great event put on the PF by the PFT, and Brian Devine has always been so good in the past few years coming back and reporting to us on both uh, what is planned and then what is accomplished at this great event. So hopefully you can make it on April 12th at 8 a.m. at Washington Gifted. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other announcements? Ms. Patel? I have one thing I would like to say. This is not such a happy thing. Um, during the campaign, there was a great deal of nastiness that went on, as happens during campaigns. Um, and as some of you know, my child uh, was threatened. His safety was threatened at school, and we had to keep him home from school a few days. And we, my, we had decided not to talk about that. Um, but I think it's important because some of our employees' children have now been threatened and bullied at school because of the perception of how their parents feel about um, these current hot issues in the district. And this is completely inappropriate. Anyone who is trying to take an argument to children in school needs to get a grip, settle down, and leave, you know, these are, we have been asking for years for our administrators to send their children to school in the district, for our principals to send their children to school in the district, to give us that show of confidence. When those people do that, when Chris and I do that, when people on the board do that, you cannot retaliate against the children of administrators or board members or threaten those children's safety. It's unacceptable and it has to stop. Thank you. Any other announcements? In that case, uh, could I have a motion to approve the minutes of the March 10th, 2014 meeting? Second. Any discussion, uh, corrections, revisions? Would you please call the roll. Mrs. Crawford? Aye. Mr. Crawford? Aye. Mr. Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Mrs. Wolfmeyer? Aye. Mrs. Aye. Aye. Thank you. We move on to information items. Uh, item number two, Remarkable Rule 2, Respect Learning. Dr. Lathan. 
Yes, we have a presentation tonight. Um, the Next Generation Science Standards over the next several months we'll be sharing with the board updates around Common Core as it relates to math, literacy, and then also the new requirements as it relates to science. Um, Ms. Langston Rogers is here, one of our um, science curriculum facilitators to provide that information uh, to the board and the community. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. I'm here to bring you exciting news about our next generation science standards. I want to introduce you to the next generation science standards. And this is a collaborative, state-led process that developed these kindergarten through 12th grade standards that are very rich in content and they're very rich in practice. And they were developed in a manner where they are coherent across disciplines and across grade levels. So my goal for this evening is to introduce you to these next generation science standards and also the explanation of the architecture, resources available, and then to update you on the status of the adoption by the state of Illinois. So why new science standards? Well, we have four reasons we're going to look at this evening. The first one being a reduction of the United States competitive economic edge and we want to think about a shrinking share of patents. And that in 2010, half of the patents that were filed, the technology patents, were filed by foreign competitors. And we also have a diminishing export. The number one exporter in the world is China. So we're concerned about keeping that economic edge. But also we're concerned about the lagging achievement of US students. And a couple of examples of that would be the National Assessment of Education Progress, a test that was given in 2011, and it showed that eighth grade students scored, a third of them scored below basic on that assessment. And then there's an international assessment of 15 year olds as far as literacy in mathematics and literacy in science. And it, the test that was in 2009 showed that the United States ranked 14th in reading out of 34 developed countries, 17th in science, and 25th in mathematics. We're also concerned about essential preparation for new careers in the modern workforce. And we're seeing an increase in high-tech jobs, a decrease in low-skilled jobs. And we want to make sure that our students are prepared for this 21st century workforce. And we also have a lot of decisions to make when it comes to being scientifically literate, from pandemics to energy shortages. I have to figure out how to manage my health care plans and my retirement plans. So we have to bump up areas of science and mathematics for our students to be prepared. So let's look at how to read these next generation science standards. And this is included in your packet. Here's an example of one of the standards. And I know it's a lot of information there for you to look at. So I'm just going to leave that for you to investigate. I want to get to an actual standard after I break down the components of the standards. So this is kind of a framework. And there are three main areas in each standard. And these are kindergarten through 12th grade standards. So the first area at the top, the standard is always going to have a performance expectation. So we're trying to assess what the student can do. This is about the student doing science, not just regurgitating information. So we want to move from a mile wide and an inch deep of information 
to deeper, richer understanding of content where we teach our students how to think like a scientist, behave like an engineer, and make them more analytical and make them problem solvers. So the top of the standard is that performance expectation. Now that performance expectation is what the student will be assessed on. The performance expectation is formed by these three dimensions here. Science and engineering practices, the content which they call the disciplinary core ideas, and then the common themes that run throughout all areas of science that they call cross-cutting concepts. And the good part is at the bottom of every standard is that built-in connection to the common core. <coughs> so this is a third grade standard. I want you to look at the top of it. I know it's third grade because it starts with that three. The LS means it's life science. So this is biological evolution, unity, and diversity. So I want us to practice this particular standard. So I have a little activity for you. Let's do some science because science is about doing and discovering and then backing up what you have done and discovered with content. So in front of you, I kind of put you into groups of three. If you'll see in front of you, there's a plate that has some uh, Ziploc bags. One of them has, uh, I think, Skittles. There'll be two bags with Skittles and a bag of mixed M&Ms. And then you have a cup. So everyone needs their own small plastic cup. And groups of three are going to share the bags of Skittles and the bag of M&Ms. And the plate. So the plate has to be kind of placed in a way where it's equidistant from everyone. If we could do that. Because I want to show you how we need to do that science and that the uh, next generation science standards is supported by activities like this one, which came from Science Fusion. Okay. Now. So two bags of Skittles, one bag of mixed M&Ms, the paper plate, the plastic cup. Okay. And I'm going to read it to you. So this is also a listening activity. <laughs> now this activity is called the M&Ms Survival Challenge. In the wild, there are two kinds of animals, the hunters and the hunted. A good predator is always on the prowl for fresh prey. Since science can be brutal, what do animals do to avoid being eaten? Some animals have developed defense mechanisms, <coughs> like porcupine quills or the plated armor of an armadillo. armadillo. Other animals developed a gross taste on their bodies or a poisonous mucus coating. One of the most common ways that animals can avoid being eaten by a predator is by an adaptation called camouflage. This means that the animal has a set of colorings or markings that help them to blend in with the surroundings and increases their chance for survival. Now in this investigation, you are a hungry predator and you are hunting for M&M candies, which is your prey. You will hunt for M&Ms in different colored habitats. Now the Skittles are going to be your habitat. So depending on which color, you might have an orange habitat, a green habitat, and so on for the five colors for the Skittles. Now you are testing whether some M&Ms do better in some habitats than others. So if you're working in groups of three, I need for you to kind of number yourself off. You'll be predator one, assign a predator two, assign a predator three and for each little group. One, two, three. Three. Okay. One. 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 And this is a good activity for third graders. This is a third grade activity because you could, you could, you want to encourage them not to eat the candy in the bags because it's been through many hands and I can't guarantee that those hands were clean. So you can kind of let them know that after the activity for the number of prey they caught, that you would give them clean Skittles or clean M&Ms. So that's kind of an encouragement for them. Okay? Okay, we ready? All right. Now predator number one, if you can do me a favor. I want you to dump the M&Ms onto the plate. Just the M&Ms. In 
then choose one of the colored habitats, just one of the Skittle bags, and take the Skittle bag, whichever color that you've chosen, and put it with the M&Ms on the plate. Just dump them there, yes. Now, you're gonna make a beak. You are a predator bird. So you have a beak here, and your beak, the only thing you can pick up your prey with will be your pointer finger and your thumb, okay? Now, the prey are the M&Ms. The plastic cup is your stomach. So as you pick up the M&Ms with your beak only, you're gonna drop them into the cup. As many prey as you can. Now avoid the Skittles because the Skittles make you ill. So you only want the M&Ms. You're gonna have 20 seconds. Are there any questions about those instructions? All three of you are gonna be competing for that common environment. So kinda of make sure that plate is in an area where you all can reach fairly the prey. Okay? Now let me get the timer on my cell phone and we'll be ready to go. And we're going to do this twice. We'll just do it twice. Normally you would do it five times with the students for the five different colored habitats, but we'll just do it twice with the ones you have in front of you. One at a time and go into the stomach. Okay, 20 seconds. Are you ready? Go. <laughs> Stop. Okay. Now you have a, a data sheet in front of you, and what you would do is you would record the number of correct prey you picked up based on the color and put it on that data sheet. And if you pick up any Skittles, you also have to report, record that number underneath where it says habitat. So if you had orange Skittles, it would go under the orange Skittle habitat and so on. you've done your recording, I need for you to take the Skittles out and put them back in the Skittle bag. We're going to do it a second time with your second habitat when you're ready. Yes, all the Skittles go back into the Skittle bag. I'm sorry? No, you can leave them on the plate because you're going to mix in the second habitat with those M&Ms. Yeah, we're going to do it the second time. Normally it would be five times because they're five colored Skittles. Keep the M&Ms on the plate only and take the Skittles off. Yeah, and put them back. Okay, let me know when you're ready for the second habitat data collection. I'm sorry? Put the second color in, yes. Now try not to eat the candy, as tempting as it may be. Don't eat it. It's dirty. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, you ready? Go. So if you could again count the number of prey that you were able to capture, and if you unfortunately captured any of those Skittles, that would make you sick. And record it, please. And the student would do this three more times. And then they would collect data from everyone in the classroom, and they would be graphing that would go on as a result of this. And it would give the students an opportunity to discuss maybe differences in a beak, or maybe differences in the type of prey or candy that was chosen. And they could develop other experiments from this particular experiment. This was kind of fun, wasn't it? I know adults don't think the same way kids do, but kids enjoy this. Did you kind of enjoy it? OK. All right. <laughs> so we want to think about our students thinking more like a scientist, thinking more like an engineer. And even if they do not choose those career paths, they're going to develop the ability to problem solve and to analyze. And so those eight practices that are so key with these new standards, the science and engineering practices, are the things that scientists do as they make discoveries, and the things engineers do as they solve problems. So in this particular activity, there was a question that was asked. Our science fusion book provides essential questions, but the students can also come up with questions that they want to be answered. This particular question was, how can we model a physical adaptation? And they also can develop further experiments that involve that predator-prey relationship as far as adaptations are concerned. So there's a developing and using models that goes on with this. We would get the class information and analyze and interpret that data and represent it in different kinds of ways. There's the mathematics piece that's addressed here. And students could start engaging in constructive, passionate, scientific discussions based on any kind of discoveries they made about that predator-prey relationship with this activity. So the Next Generation Science Standards, this is a, a snapshot of the website I took today because I was eagerly waiting for Illinois to adopt these standards. And if you see where it's circled down here, it says Nevada officially adapt, adopts and that Illinois is, what does it say, perched? Oh, thank you. <laughs> My old eyes. To follow. So what we know about that is that State Board of Education unanimously voted to accept these new standards, and that happened in January. So now we're waiting for that legislative review to take place. And we know that adoption is going to follow that. So this is a very exciting time in science, because science is going to become an exciting experience for the students. They're going to be doing science. And the standard calls for the student to do science often. And that's the foundation. And then we support the doing and the discovery with the content. So doing first, and you read about it later. Not that reading about it and talking about it and not doing it enough. So this is exciting. And the resources, excuse me, that we have in the curriculum, the Science Fusion and the HMH resources for the high school science piece, all support the next generation science standards. So here are some uh, resources that you can look as far as the website. The standards can be downloaded. That will be helpful for anyone who's interested in finding out more about our impending next generation science standards. Any questions? Just, just a little earlier there. <laughs> oh, 
Well, I, I want to compare <laughs> outcomes of these groups and see who did well, so. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, I, I do have a couple questions. Yes. Just, did somebody else have some? Just. So, in, in the process of um, exposing students to this, what's the opportunity to expose students to people that actually practice engineering and science and other things of that nature as as their business and profession how do we how do we expose kids to the idea that it's not just something you do in the classroom but this is a way to have a career and a life and an opportunity right, and right. something that's very very intellectually and and uh, it's, it's intellectually challenging but it also has uh, substantial rewards to it how do we how do we get that message across well currently our resource science fusion has videos where the students look at the life of scientists in different disciplines and kind of get to experience what they're doing through that whole video. So there is something that touches on that piece right now. But it would be wonderful to bring in real live breathing human scientists that they could talk to. And Right. So we do, um, some schools do bring in speakers to go through some of this stuff. I'm glad you said that, Dr. Kennedy, because I was just at uh, day treatment, and the ag lag came in there with piglets, and it was so exciting. And they came in with chickens another time when I went over to the sea. So just the real world relevancy of science is going on. And it's also an opportunity for uh, businesses in the area that employ people in those areas to yes. provide speakers to come into the schools and talk about it. I mean, it's, it's one thing to see it in the classroom. It's another thing to hear about it from somebody that's actually doing that as their, as their job. Mm -hmm. So, okay, any other questions? It's a very interesting presentation, and uh, we improved by 10 <laughs> M&Ms in our second <laughs> trial, if that means anything to you. So. Okay. Well. It was easier to pick them out on the contrasting habitat, if that makes any sense. Yes, and that's a whole piece that you could jump off on with the students and to oh, talk about well, that. Yes. See, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, next is uh, remarkable rule number three respect our finances. Dr. Kinney, uh, this is about purchases over $2,500. <coughs> I just uh, was looking at it, and I know obviously we've had a hard winter, and we've had substantial uh, fuel and uh, natural gas, fuel oil, and other expenses. Uh, how are we doing in terms of uh, opportunities to improve energy efficiency? Well, obviously, one of the things we keep trying to do is, is uh, uh, apply for any energy grants that we can get and uh, do things like replacing lights that are heavy energy users with uh, fixtures that, that are a lot less energy uh, absorbing. Uh, certainly we continue to look at everything we try to do and see what we can do to keep thermostats down when we can, those kinds of things. So. And, and I also think uh, some of the things we're gonna be dealing with tonight in terms of improved uh, infrastructure in a couple of buildings yes. where that's going yes. to have an impact as well. It will. <coughs> terms of that yep. okay any okay. questions I just have a question um, maybe can't answer it right now but how does it compare this year's cost compare because we have done some renovations in a lot of the schools and um, well I know that uh, one, one of year. one of the ones we were just recently looking at if I'd have known you're gonna ask I'd have the exact numbers but uh, we were comparing Peoria high with the things we've done there and I keep in mind that again that we did add the air conditioning part of it and our utility bills have been less. Uh, and I want to say a couple thousand a month, but I will get you the exact information. No, this is we just did that. So. An estimate, fine. Yeah, there's a long-term payoff on a lot of those. And right. And DCEO also helps fund a lot of that through those energy grants. So yes. That's one thing that the state does encourage that. And that's based on the amount we consume, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Uh, they take into account degree days, all the whole. Right gamut of information so okay good any other questions on that okay uh, we have uh, next
the consent agenda. Do I have a volunteer to read the consent agenda this evening? And there are a large number of gifts, and I would say you could summarize them rather than read them individually. <laughs> Ms. Gostick, would you like to do that? <laughs> I looked at you and I thought maybe you don't want to do that, so. Yeah, just start with number one there and make sure you're right. <laughs> Gifts to the school district. This meeting, $2,395. Year to date, $90,976.43. The proposed action is that the Board of Education accept the following donations be accepted and letters of appreciation to, to be sent to the donors. Um, wow. there, there are a large there number are of them. A large number of donations that have been given to the district um, and they will be acknowledged at a later date. Um, that's it? Okay, just keep, keep going if you like. Okay, Number the two. following donations were made to Heinz School Multicultural Night. Los Himadores, food valued at 200. China Express, 25. Luisi Pizzano, food valued at 200. And Shiada Lanza. And I'm sure I'm not pronouncing any of those correctly. $25. Payment of bills, Dr. Kinney. Human Resources Report. Proposed action, appointment, employment, compensation, performance, resignations, retirements, or discharge of an employee. Payment for travel. Approval of amended intergov intergovernmental agreement with the City of Peoria for the sale of the adult education, Old Washington facility, located at 839 West Moss giving a marketing extension until August 31st, 2014. The proposed action is that the Board of Education approves the extension made and entered into this 24th day of March 2014 by and between the Board of Education of Peoria, Dis Peoria School District Number 150, Peoria County, Illinois Board, and the City of Peoria, Peoria County, Illinois. The board currently holds title to the parcel of real estate commonly known as the Old Washington School located at 839 West Moss Street, Peoria, Illinois, and no longer needs the property for its educational needs, therefore desires to sell it. Because the property has historical significance to the community and the city has a desire to see the property developed in such a manner that will maintain a certain level of such historical presence and a manner consistent with the surrounding neighborhood, the board desires to cooperate with the city to see a purchaser of the property on such terms and conditions that are reasonably acceptable to the city and to the board. This action extends the original agreement. Item number six, purchase of Feldman printing properties. The proposed action is that the Board of Education is asked to approve the purchase of the following properties for $200,000, a tax ID number 18 04101-014 at 1744 North Sheridan Road, Peoria. Tax ID number 18041010015 at 1738 North Sheridan Road, Peoria, Illinois. Tax ID number 18041010161732 North Sheridan Road, <coughs> Peoria, Illinois. And lastly, tax ID number 18041010. 30 West Woodruff Boulevard, Peoria, Illinois. The negotiated price is considerably less than that of the fair market value. Item number seven, approve Mechanical Services Incorporated to install an HVAC system for Woodrow Wilson Primary School. The proposed action is that the Board of Education is asked to approve a contract pending our legal review for Mechanical Services Incorporated, MSI to install heating, air conditioning, and ventilation at Woodrow Wilson Primary School. MSI was the low bidder with four companies submitting bids. Our recommendation is, <coughs> is to also include alternate one, which adds casings around the piping and conduit in the classrooms at a cost of $18,000, making the contract price $1,383,000. Item number eight, 
approve Illinois Piping Corporation to install HVAC system for Bond Steuben Middle School. The proposed action is that the Board of Education is asked to approve a contract pending our legal review for the Illinois Piping Corporation IPC to install heating, air conditioning, and ventilation at Bond Steuben Middle School. IPC was the low bidder with four companies submitting bids. Our recommendation is to also include alternate one, which adds casings around pipings and conduit in the classroom. Cost $6,000, making the contract price $1,232,700. Item number nine, contract with CAM services for removal of asbestos as part of the Woodrow Wilson Primary School HVAC installation project. The proposed action is that the Board of Education is asked to approve the attached contract with CAM. KAM services for asbestos removal at Woodrow Wilson School, a necessary first step in adding new HVAC to the building. The amount of the base contract is $97,838 with alternate bid one at $6,388. We are recommending both the base bid and alternate one for the total of $104,226. Item number 10, field trip approval, Washington 7th and 8th grade. Proposed action is that the Board of Education approve the field trip for Washington 7th and 8th grade students to travel to the St. Louis Zoo on May 20th, 2014, per board policy 6 240. The destination supports core standards and objectives. The trip is being paid for through funding, fundraising activities. No student will be denied attendance due to inability to pay. Item number 11, field trip approval, Washington School Student Council. The proposed action is that the Board of Education approve the field trip for Washington School Student Council per board policy 6 240. The Student Council will be traveling to Springfield, Illinois to attend, to attend the annual Illinois Association of Junior High Student Council's convention on April 25th, 2014 through April 26th, 2014. Students will be participating in leadership skills and learn building activities. No child will be denied attendance due to fees associated with this trip. Item number 12, field trip approval. Proposed action is that the Board of Education approve the field trip for Peoria High School geometry students and other school, schools if requested to travel to Six Flags, St. Louis, Illinois, May the 2nd, 2014, per board policy 6-240. Students will participate in the Math, Science, and Engineering Day, learning to use geometric and algebraic, algebraic principles in the real-world setting. The trip is being partially funded through Title I. Again, no student will be denied attendance due to inability to pay. That concludes the items on our consent agenda. Thank you, and it's a lengthy one, and I appreciate your willingness to go through that. Could we have a... Uh, are there any items that uh, board members would like to have pulled for a separate vote? There being none, then could we have a, a motion for the uh, approval of the consent agenda? So moved. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, any discussion or questions? Just one point of clarification on item number 12, the field trip approval for the Math, Science, and Engineering Day. <coughs> the trip will be funded for Peoria High through Title I funds. Other schools, if requested, will be through educational funds. And it will be for middle and high school students in the district. Okay. Thank you. I believe that's also associated with Project Lead the Way as well. Yes. Okay. Um, any other questions? I, I have a couple. But... Uh, could you, uh, either Dr. Kenny or Dr. Uh, Lathan, just discuss the briefly the city agreement with the uh, Washington School facility on Moss, just why we're doing that and what's what's happening there? Yes, in their in their first effort, uh, they did have one proposal that came back, and uh, it, it did uh, that that group did pull out. So this time we've extended the agreement uh, for a longer period of time because they'd like to uh, get this RFP out. Uh, for the purchase of that building actually uh, in a much bigger area. So, uh, and, and it takes more time. If you're doing a national uh, RFP, it, it can take a little more time for people to get back to you about the potential purchase. But uh, we continue to want to work with the city on this. Uh, it's to everyone's benefit. If we can find a purchaser that meets the needs of the neighborhood, the city, and, and us. And so it's a logical extension we did put in uh, a clause in the extension that they're going to go ahead and pay the utilities and, and certainly help with the maintenance 
uh, as, as this extends for another six months. Okay, and in, in somewhat similar or in the same general area, the purchase of the uh, properties uh, on Sheridan Road and Woodward Boulevard? Yes, uh, I'm glad you asked. That is uh, basically known as Feldman Printing, and uh, it's, a, it's a very good purchase for us. It's 20,000 square feet of very good solid space for a price of uh, $200,000, it's about $10 a square foot. It's very hard to find that kind of facility for that price. Uh, it offers us some very unique opportunities. Um, bottom line, I think what'll happen over a period of time is we'll be able to use that property and move buildings and grounds. That'll free up buildings and grounds for a multitude of uses, including uh, some peripheral um, use of uh, the facility for concessions, for restrooms, those kinds of things, so we don't have to build any of that new. Uh, we're going to be able to take one of the middle buildings and be able to use it for our automotive auto body class, uh, and then eventually be able to expand that to include auto mecha mechanics. So that's probably one of the neatest things about this whole thing. It's going to give us a, a very inexpensive way to uh, uh, put some of those vocational programs back at uh, Peoria High because we'll be able to use that facility. And, and I do want to mention uh, uh, we're just really excited for Mr. Feldman as he's working with us uh, because he feels like this is an opportunity to kind of give back to Peoria High. So we're, we're certainly excited about what we're going to be able to do. And, and this is somewhat in conjunction with the other developments there yes, in the it Peoria is. High campus area. Right. Okay. Any other questions? And then uh, also, uh, there was a question raised about the two uh, HVAC uh, system quotes. I know it was quoted jointly and also individually. Could you sort of uh, uh, describe how that went and why the decision when recommendation was made as it was? Sure. As we looked at the two jobs, and by the way, these are being paid for by capital projects funds. This is we're towards the tail end of the money that we got from the Capital Development Board. So we're using those funds to do these. Uh, as we bid it out, we looked at uh, or allowed the contractors to bid on both projects or bid on them singly. Uh, when you worked it the way we wanted it to be with uh, the base bid and the alternate one putting that casing in, uh, we actually saved about $300 by going to two different contractors. Uh, there's also, so, so it is low bid, that's what we wanted to offer uh, to you, but also by having two different contractors, we're on a very tight time frame. Uh, Dr. Lathan has said that we need to have this in place before school starts in the fall. So having two different contractors, I think, will help with that that goal. So, and and did the bids come in uh, at expected levels or? Oh, I, good question. No, they're actually quite a bit lower. It's a very competitive process right now. That kind of work is very competitive. So from our original estimates that uh, we had. Uh, including what the engineers thought it might come in, and we're probably combined uh, a good six or seven hundred thousand less. So Could you we're repeat that money. just for the benefit sure. of those present. <laughs> because of the competitive nature of that uh, kind of work right now, we were able to get these at uh, uh, probably about six or seven hundred thousand less than what we thought. Now, it would actually be a little more, but we're going to spend some money with some asbestos removal. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then, uh, there being no other question or discussion, uh, would you please call the roll on the consent agenda? Mr. Krasnick? Aye. Mr. Crawford? Aye. Mr. Dobbs? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Mrs. Wolfmeyer? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, the deliberation agenda? Um, Uh, item 13, expulsions. The proposed action is that the expulsions listed on the report dated March 24th, 2014 be approved as presented. Second. Would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Costi. Aye. Mr. Crawford. Aye. Mrs. Crawford. Aye. Mrs. Ross. Aye. Mrs. Aye. 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 Students no expelled. Oh. I'm sorry, go ahead. Students expelled by the board are referred to by number, thereby ensuring privacy. Board action concerning the students has been decided in executive session. Thank you. Uh, there were no other items on the deliberation agenda. That brings us to the presentations by the audience. Members of the public may address the school board on any topic. 
please come to the podium and give your name for the benefit of our minutes. As this is a committee of the whole meeting, the time limit for any one speaker is two minutes, and the time limit for any one topic is eight minutes. No person less than 18 years of age may address the board unless accompanied by his or her parent, guardian, or teacher, except with unanimous consent of the board. And we begin this evening with Monica Wilson. Good evening. My name is Monica Wilson. I am one of the current 19 school resource officers employed by the district. First off, I would like to thank those board members who have uh, responded to my recent email. I greatly appreciate that, and I hope the lines of communication will remain open. I'm here today to talk about the school resource officers and our decertification by the Illinois Training Board. Before I get to the heart of this matter, I would like to ask the board this question. What is so wrong with our school district having their own police department? The possibilities are endless with what we can offer and what we can achieve. Across the nation, school districts are now starting their own police departments. Most have been very successful. Unfortunately, the Columbines and Sandy Hook incidents are a reality of today within our schools. Other districts are looking, looking to serve as our, I'm sorry, other districts are looking to arm teachers and to provide protection while we, District 150, should be serving as a beacon to other districts by providing training, instruction, ammunition, and more. We are now being pushed backwards at a time when society needs our protection the most. Having said that, there is a solution to getting our certifications back, and that is through <coughs> legislation. You have told the public numerous times that you didn't want this to happen to us. If you are truly sincere in what you said, then you will take a stand and help us amend the current law to allow District 150 and all school districts in Illinois to have their own police departments if they so choose so. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Dan DeGaulle. My name is Dan DeGal. I'm here representing Change 150. Before I start, and I'm sure that this might put me a little bit long, but uh, first of all, let me say that, um, that, Laura, I completely agree with your sentiment earlier. Neither I nor anyone on Change 150 agrees with uh, the making of personal threats um, to either you, your children, or any other person. Personal threats are completely unacceptable. So on Friday, March 14th, we held a joint press conference with a, uh, uh, during which we outlined our core values and what we believe are the core issues that you, the board, need to pay urgent attention to. There seems to be some debate on the state of the district's organizational culture. Many believe that the current culture is one that includes fear and intimidation. The superintendent, on the other hand, insists instead that there is a culture of high expectations and accountability. There's a very simple way to find out. Change 150 requests that you, the board, commission an independent, third-party review of the environment and organizational culture within the district. There is a very simple, or I'm sorry, this is not a recommendation that we make flippantly or lightly. A Google search for organizational culture yields over 31 million results. Peter Drucker famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's such an important component of organizational effectiveness that every year companies from all over the globe compete to be listed in annual listings of the best places to work in magazines such as Forbes, CNN Money, and by organizations such as the Great Place to Work Institute. Addressing this core issue aligns with three of our core values, including communication, clarity of issues, and care and concern for stakeholders. An independent review would provide candid and honest communication from the employees in the district to the administration and you, the board. Part of treating staff and teachers with respect, dignity, and fairness is providing them a feedback channel to express their opinions in a safe, constructive manner. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Atkins-Dudrow. 
Good evening, Jeff Atkins Dutro, president of the Peoria Federation of Teachers, a proud English teacher at Peoria High School, the pride of the city. Uh, a couple of comments and questions. Um, at the last board meeting, I asked the board and administration uh, to meet to discuss two issues. Uh, what is the disconnect between the district and the community, and how can we work together to do something about it? I uh, didn't receive any response to that request. Uh, however, I do have several other dates um, during which we are free. Uh, April 9, 10, 15, 16, or 17, all at 3 o'clock. So that invitation is certainly still open and on the table. Um, I would also like to know and would like for the community to know where the board stands with regards to two electoral events, the school board election and the sales tax referendum. Uh, specifically, I'd like to know if you're going to listen to and work with your grassroots stakeholders uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jesse McGowan, Jr. Uh, Jesse McGowan, 707 East Thrush. You know who I'm here. <laughs> Two years ago, I came to you all. I've talked to these, every one of y'all, at least I've called, called about the same thing, parental involvement. All I've gotten is a runaround in two years' time. You sent me to the Parent Advisory Committee. I don't know if you're aware or not, they don't deal with parental involvement. Title I says each district must have a parental involvement committee. I guarantee you, neither one of y'all could tell me what a committee is here at District 150. You don't have one. I am sick of everybody complaining, but nobody's doing anything about these kids being expelled, suspended, and dropping out. It bothers me every time I go to my grandson's first grade class, I look at the black boys in that class knowing when I come back 12 years from now, this graduation, half of them won't be there. Nobody seems to be doing anything about it. We're not going to do anything until we get the parents involved to stop this stuff, and I can't get no help from any of you. I don't know why you say all of the right things, but when time comes to put up action, you know, you know, you're not, you're not existence. All I get is run around. I went to the Parent Advisory Committee for over a year before our board members Patel and Butler finally told me they don't deal with parental involvement. Nobody else is dealing with, dealing with it. Who, I would like for it to record, who deals with parental involvement? I would like for y'all to state that now so I can hold you to it come election time. Thank you. Rick Kirkbride, is that pronounced correctly? Yes. Rick Kirkbride. I just am uh, addressing the board because I feel that you had a vision four years ago. You went through with it. The public listened to it, watched, and it isn't working. It's time to change the vision. You need to listen to the public who's been very involved the last 14, 15 months since all these different controversies come up. I think it's time to bring this board back to civility, address the public correctly, listen to the public, and handle these issues openly and in an open discussion, have board meetings where there's questions and answer period, not make a closed door meeting in the back where you always make all the decisions. Please bring back civility and make this school district what it used to be. Your vision of four years ago is not working. Thank you. Thank you. Terry C. Knapp. I talked last meeting about Chanel Henley, who has exited the district, re resigned, and many of us gave her gifts. I'm sure that you gave her gifts. Hopefully you gave her an exit survey so that you can understand why she left this district for not calling Granita Dr. Lathan. I mentioned last time uh, several people with doctoral titles. Uh, Herschel Hanna, who was in charge of minority hiring for this district, was a doctor. He was also a reverend. Never once did I call Herschel doctor or reverend. You know, his name was Herschel, and that's, that's the way we handle things. Dr. Jerome Greer, again, who was also high on minority hiring, was Dr. Jerome Greer. I never called him doctor, never was asked to call him doctor. He was Jerome to me. 
if we are narcissistic enough to have to be called doctor, I noticed uh, uh, Ms. Butler uh, the other day on H. Wayne Wilson's show, you called him H. I mean, just H. Did he call you L? I mean, I, I guess it's okay to call you L. I, I know you called him H on TV, on PBS. So that's kind of an interesting concept to me. I'd like to mention that at the last meeting, Ravonda Johnson uh, was taken to task by some parents for improper playground uh, supervision, and she was also said to have uh, used profanity on the playground. The next day, going back to bullying Ms. Patel, uh, the parents, the policy was changed so parents could no longer go to playground duty or go over and visit their kids without going some, through some type of tight scrutiny. The next morning, after one of your administrators who was there the next day, I mean, what was her punishment? She came from North Carolina with a suspicious background. She was actually asked not to come to Peoria but was on her way anyway. Dr. Lathan asked her not to come to Peoria. She wound up here anyway and now has these things going on. I would suggest you look into it. Hey. <laughs> Elaine Hopkins. Good evening. The uh, election results are very disconcerting for the school board here. The sales tax referendum failed, even though I voted for it. And I don't even live in District 3, but that is a rebuke also against the school board personally. And probably the sales tax referendum failed for the same reason. Well, actions speak louder than words. We can talk all day about what to do. But here are my suggestions for th some things you can do to gain back the respect and support of the public. First of all, standardize the times and the places of the board meetings. Hold the board meetings at 6.30 right here. Not 6 one time, 6.30 the next, that's ridiculous. Second, standardize the public comments. Uh, maybe four or five minutes, that's plenty of time. Do that at every meeting, have it before all the other things so that people who wanna say something and get back home to their families can do so. Second, Freedom of Information Act issues. Stop trying to frustrate those who file Freedom of Information Act requests. Don't call them recurrent requesters to delay the responses. That's ridiculous. They will agree to a delay if it's necessary. I know I certainly will, and I'm sure the rest of them will too. Don't try to frustrate the public trying to get information from you. Let them have the information and then listen when they give it back to you at these public comments. Next, fiscal responsibility. Cancel those P cards and credit cards. That's the appearance of impropriety, no matter what has really happened there. It looks to me like you're frustrating the bidding process or trying to subvert it. I don't know. I've seen some of those results. They don't look good, but I haven't seen them all. There's a way to do that. Get rid of them and then when you do that, institute limits on travel and meals and the like, financial limits. If you need a model, go to the state universities and do what they do. They don't allow unlimited spending on trips. Thank you. Sharon Cruz. The superintendent's recent calls for in increased communication need clarification as to the meaning of communication. Lathan's actions and words convey the message that communication occurs mostly when she is the speaker, while the listeners absorb information and or follow orders. The reality seems to be that punishment awaits those who would question any of her orders. I believe one of the very first principles to express a difference of opinions was banned from principal's meetings. He was soon demoted, was banned, from, uh, consequently sought and received a better offer elsewhere. There are many such stories to tell. Shutting people up and out does not create a healthy educational environment. Lathan also stated that she has tried to explain her strategic plan to the public, the implication being that we are not listening. On the recent at, it, at issue program, Butler said the public needs to listen. Recently, 3,700 voters were listening and watching and voted accordingly. 
Now is the time for two-way communication. Schools, successful schools are built with a chain of relationships, not with a chain of command. Lathan first tried to destroy relationships between principals and teachers by playing fruit basket upset. So far, most of the relationships between teachers and teachers and teachers and their students have been salvaged. And all that is good in this district is coming from those relationships. Lathan brought all her relations ships and loyalty with her and she and they have built few Peoria based relationships. All we have is a talking head issuing orders that are followed only out of fear and intimidation. Now board members the ball of communication is in your court. Please stop listening to only one side District 150's future is in your hands. Thank you. Mimi McDonald. Good evening. My name is Mimi McDonald. And um, I watched uh, Channel 47 the other night, and I was hoping I would get an answer to the question that I've asked at the previous board meeting, and it wasn't answered, so I'm going to ask it again. And that is, I really need to know why Dr. Latham changed the leadership of uh, 24 uh, of 24 of the 27 schools. Uh, five principals resigned, two principals retired early, one principal reassigned, seven principals demoted, one principal fired, three assistant principals demoted, <clears throat> four central office administrators resigned or were demoted. <clears throat> She said on that program that she talked to you, you, the Board of Education. This was her action plan. You approved this. So I guess if she can't tell me how this was for the betterment of the children, surely one of the seven of you can. Because it had to be done for some reason, but I'll be darned if I know what it is. And Mr. Cloyd, I'd like to know, did you look in the issue of Charter Oak School of the accessibility and what has happened since the last board meeting? I'll respond later. Thank you. Um. Is this Marin Dugal or yeah. is that correct? Marin Dugal. Dugal, sorry. Any, any relation? Oh, he's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the worst thing I do. Okay. Hi, my name is Marin Dugal. I am a Charter Oak parent of a third grader and also the current PTC president. I want to touch on two points tonight. Uh, first, we started this school year with new challenges long before December came along. New students, new classrooms, and new teachers. Our school is different now. Not all of it is good, but there are many positive things happening every day. Every day our teachers and support staff come to school ready to teach and take care of our children. They do this with a positive and professional attitude. They're the backbone of our school and are wonderful role models and teachers to our children. If they are fearful, they leave it at the door and do what must be done to make our school the amazing place it is. They have never slacked in their duties or shown a negative attitude in the hallways or to our children. They have welcomed over 75 new students to our halls and have taught those students what is expected to be a positive and participating member of our school. They give back in so many ways, volunteering, putting together our behavior celebrations, and being someone that any student can turn to in a time of need. Every day I walk into that school and see dedicated teachers trying to make the best of a terrible situation. I applaud them and all that they do for Charter Oak and our students. They are truly an asset to the district and our school. My second point is in regards to the new policy pertaining to parents not being allowed on the playground for lunch recess. This has never been an issue before and only comes about after an incident involving the kindergartners was brought to the board's attention. The incident was not the fault of a parent, yet we are the ones who got punished. 
it is my understanding that no other primary schools in the district currently have this same policy. The district proclaims its desire for parental involvement and then revokes the rights where parents are most involved. Which way do you want it? We would like this policy to be removed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Travis Bowlby, is that correct? Yes. I'm uh, also a teacher in the district and a very proud union member, I believe, in both of those things. But uh, I'm not the best extemporaneous speaker, so I wrote down these remarks. But I come here tonight also with something of an appeal for civility. Accelerating over the past few months, but certainly beginning well before that, there has been an outpouring of rage directed against the current school board and district administration. Much of the criticism has come from a very vocal and often very confrontational faction. In some cases, the arguments have been based more on personal frustration and uh, perceived injustices rather than on facts. While the school board and administration are in no way perfect, and like all of us are prone to making errors, they have gotten many things right. And I feel that those things have not uh, had a lot of attention, certainly by the very small and vocal faction, or large and vocal faction, whatever it may be. Over the past few years, we've had things like the new curriculum fairs, parent university, improved textbooks, and technology. Those are just a few things that come to mind that are tangible evidence of those. Uh, to say that they have done nothing but harm to the students of District 150 is an out-and-out -out lie. You may disagree, and you may have arguments, but you can't forget the good things that have been accomplished with the current administration over the last four years. Furthermore, and really most importantly, no member of the board or administration deserves to be the recipient of personal attacks and the downright harassment which some have received. The uproar against the board and administration seems to have been brought out the absolute worst amongst many in the community. It is okay to disagree, it's okay to state your case, but it's never okay to lay out vicious, hurtful, and personal attacks. Progress or good change will never come from that. Finally, and getting very specifically, Ravonda Johnson has done more for the students in this district in the last few years than a lot of other people combined. It would take me a lot longer than a few minutes to state those things. Some of the character accusations made against her, like in intentional negligence, heartlessness, cruelty, etc., are absurd. They are shameful, really. If you ever worked with her, and I'd ask any teacher, be they a, a curriculum coordinator or a facilitator or a union leader, how many bad dealings they've had with her, you'd have a hard time finding any. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Savino Sierra. My name is Savino Sierra. I live at 1708 South Stanley. That's God's country in the deep south side. I'm just wondering, you, you people up there say you're listening and hearing uh, from your critics. But I say you're either hard hearing or don't comprehend what is uh, telling you. and. Uh, you don't, because you don't act on anything that uh, this um, um, watchdog committee uh, recommends to you. And uh, when that comes time to answer these, uh, the critics, uh, we, uh, I don't get nothing from it, you know. I, I might, uh, it seems like I get a, uh, what do you call it? A bad uh, smile from the superintendent, but uh, what I'm talking about right now is you're spending our money uh, badly. You and the board of S and superintendent, you've ruined our neighborhood uh, schools, closed Woodruff, and then we opened it, buying and selling properties carelessly. And uh, what you should be doing is uh, bringing the, help bring the Peoria Stadium up to date and uh, just little things like uh, the toilet paper uh, 
receptacles in the in some of the bathrooms of the uh, public high schools because I visit all those places, you know, and uh, and uh, being a 50-year uh, member of the building building and trades uh, people, I notice all that. And uh, what's uh, you go you go without making improve. Uh, important in, t in time all you as a s board and superintendent it's time for uh, all of you to uh, uh, resign if you don't your time is coming and the, the quicker the better you have lost all the trust of all board members from me and super so uh, let's get with it. what's more important you know you you talk about you have the uh, students all with that uh, uh, toys, you know, the mic, uh, the uh, computers and all that. What, you what are you going to do when uh, they can't get that computer? It shows in the. Thank you very much. Just a minute, please. It shows on the on the uh, um, spelling bee. You don't see nobody from District 150 make it. He, the young boy was from Dunlap School District. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And pay attention to what thank you I'm very talking much. about. And let Kathleen me hear from Kathleen Dessenbaugh. I came before you. I've been to every board meeting since the 9th of December. I've spoke to you many times about many things. I am disheartened tonight because of what happened at Charter Oak. You've heard about it. Um, I cannot believe that a parent stood up here talking to each one of you from her heart about what she saw happen on our playground on a Friday afternoon. And the very next day, this administration sent out the, the wolves and basically said to all of us parents, you are not allowed to come see your children at lunch anymore and be on our playground. It is absolutely ridiculous. I have spoken to the regional superintendent personally about this issue, and she told me that it sounded like it was completely out of line. Why would anybody tell parents that they can't come in the primary grade level and spend time with their children? It was a witch hunt. We've had many of them in this district. I am a wife of a Air Force member 30 plus years who's still serving our country. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I am sick and tired of seeing the absolute disregard for our country, our children. It's at every level, everywhere you look anymore. You sit up here, you talk about the fact that you care about our children and that all the decisions that you make, whether it's here at the Horseshoe or whether it's in your executive sessions, are for our children. Really? You need to look in the mirror and look at yourselves and ask yourselves every day. I'm sick and tired of being told of all your degrees and how much education you have. I have a college education. That doesn't make me a great person. Okay? You guys need to really get back to the grassroots of why you wanted to be on this board. We sent a huge message last Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen. There's a bigger one coming. Thank you. Could we uh, respond to those uh, comments, Dr. Latham? I, I would like to respond. Butler. And it's probably been a long time coming. Um, it's very discouraging and disappointing for some individuals to come to the podium and speak their mind when they're wrong. And the program at issue, which I was a part of, in briefing with Mr. H. Wayne Wilson, I addressed him as such. He asked me to call him H. There you go. I didn't say he didn't. No, no, but you should have known what you were talking about. I knew what I was talking no, about. No, no, you right. did Just, not know. This is not a so, debate. This is not that, a debate. If anybody else want to validate it, call Mr. H. Wayne Wilson, and he will tell you it was at his request that he would be called H on his own program. 
again, this just goes back to show that many of the things that are said are not truthful, unfounded, misjudged, and just wrong altogether. And this was evidence of it tonight. I personally never called Dr. Hannah anything but Dr. Hannah, maybe because you guys were real good friends, you're on a first name basis, but I, you know, mostly called Dr. Kinney, Dr. Lath, and Dr. Hannah. If that's what people want to be called, it's trivial to address them that way. And it was not like that. Once again, we have people that are interfering in district business and don't know the whole story, and they get up and tell one side. As it relates to the movement and changes of principals and assistant principals, that question has been addressed. Not only were board members a part of the process, principals and assistant principals were also a part of the process. You might not agree with personnel changes, but we sit down and we talk with staff. We don't just wake up in the morning and look at ourselves in the mirror and make a decision to make changes. Changes. It's a better, careful right? plan uh, to that entire well, process. Just, please, you had your chance. We're trying to respond to it. <laughs> Keep going. In regard to the playground issue, <coughs> the policy for playgrounds is set at an individual school level. And we have a complete summary of those policies, and it varies from school to school. And that's as it's been done in this district for some time. Uh, in the case of this situation, there are parents that were there, and frankly, they were involved in being on a playground. I don't know all the circumstances of why they were there or what they were doing, but we have a responsibility to the safety of those children, and we need to be sure that who's in the building and who's on the playground are authorized to be there and if the principal decides that that is inappropriate or not in conducive to what's going on in the building or on the playground that's their responsibility to deal with that the policy is set by the individual school principal and and various places do that and sign in and it depends on the individual school. Well, we're not going to debate that. It does not stop. It, it does not stop parents from attending lunch with their children. That did not happen. I have a couple. We're going to uh, Miss Miss Patel. Um, yes, uh, Mr. McGowan, I think Reverend Butler and I directed you to York Powers, who is in charge of the parental involvement piece, um, and we can get you his contact information again, if that's necessary. Um, with regard to the issues addressed behind closed doors, uh, most of those are legally required to be addressed behind closed doors. I'm sure you would not want, if your child were you know, in disciplinary trouble would not want that discussed in public in front of the entire community on television. Personnel issues by law are discussed behind closed doors. I understand that is the most frustrating thing because school board decisions relating to personnel and students are the ones that are the most upsetting, but that's not a thing that we can change. We hear your frustration. We can't really help with that. Um, Elaine, in terms of travel spending, a lot of that money is earmarked, and I know we have had this conversation before. The money comes from the federal government that has to be used on training and travel. The money, if it's not used, doesn't go somewhere else into ed funds. I, you know, we should be spending reasonable amounts, but a lot of that money has to be used on travel because that's, I mean, the federal government's dub double dipping. They're giving it to us to train our teachers, and they're also pumping it into the hotel, you know, industry. So, you know, it's like when uh, we give foreign aid to Ethiopia and they can only use it to buy Caterpillar tractors. Government does this all the time. Um, anyway, this is actually not a great travel report for that because we do have several out of the ed funds, but most of our travel reports, it's mostly title money or grant funds that has to be used for travel. Any other comments? Okay, uh, presentations and suggestions by board members. Mr. Floyd. Yes, ma'am. 
again, I would request that present with the information when individuals come to the meeting uh, is a um, document that sets the um, standards uh, for addressing the board and the issues that are to be addressed. There's been, um, as some would say, a can of worms that has been open that's crawling around in this community where for too long people have come to this podium and been very disrespectful, outright lied on people, and that needs to stop. They need to know that we expect people to come with the truth. And if you come with the question, be willing to uh, hear the answer. It may not be what they like, but it will be the truth and it will be the answer. I think we still have to, we have to go back, as we've heard earlier this evening, talking about civility in this meeting. It's not only, not only should that be required or requested of the board members, but those who come to address the board and to watch and hear us conduct <coughs> board business. It's time out for what has been happening over these past few years that has allowed individuals to threaten board members, other staff, their children, um, put basically trash on their lawns, and all the other things that are going on in a particular area of this city. That needs to be taken care of, and we need to begin right here at this board meeting asking people to be respectful and to respect the standards of conducting business in an appropriate way in the community and in the public. Thank you. Ms. Patel. And I realize that you guys are the guys who stick it out, but it's also awfully frustrating when people come for public comment, ask for the board to respond to their issues, and immediately leave. <laughs> and then come back the next week with the same complaint. You guys obviously are the ones who stay to the end to listen to us, but that is an ongoing frustration. And, and I'll just add that I've seen on a number of occasions where a question has been addressed from the board and a, an answer has been specifically demanded and an answer is provided later on the meeting after people have left. It's very frustrating. I would also add that while the public comments are important, is an important part of the board meeting, also, our presentations are very important. And one of the reasons we, I th at least one of the reasons I believe we hold comment at the end of the meeting is so that we have a chance to communicate to you what we're doing as a school district. That's our prerogative, and I think it's a great way for us to share with the public what's going on. We want to have an audience. If you don't, if, if it's a pain to wait through those things, only to, only to wait until you can be heard, well, pardon me if I, judge your com with less credibility. I think if you really have interest in the district, one, I'm obligated to listen to your comments, but number two, I think you need to show some obligation to listen to what's going on in the district. Ms. Ross. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I have two comments. One, just to kind of dovetail on uh, what uh, um, Chris was saying, we have two board meetings a month. Uh, we have two board meetings per month usually. We have um, a regular board meeting and a committee as a whole. For those of you who haven't uh, been around very long like I have, uh, we used to have different committees, the personnel committee, the finance committee, the uh, all the different committees. So we, we, we decide to come together and make it a committee as a whole. And then that meeting is for us to inform you of what we're doing in the district. And the rules are different. And that is that the comment time is shorter, it's at a different time, but that's a meeting uh, of the committee. We used to, in our committee meetings before, we didn't allow public comments. We didn't allow people to get up and talk in the committee because it was a committee uh, taking care of board business. So we now do provide an opportunity, two minutes to speak. Um, but at a regular board meeting, that's different. You're, you get to you're, you speak in the beginning of the meeting. And um, that's our regular board meeting. So we have one that starts at 6.30, one that starts at 6 o'clock. So t somebody said they didn't know the difference. Why don't we do the same thing at all board meetings? But it's not considered a board meeting. It's considered a committee as a whole meeting. 
Now, the other comment I have is that since people keep bringing up this point that I made about everybody up here has an education, I wasn't bragging about an education. What I was saying was that, you know, we have the ability to dissect and uh, evaluate what's being given to us, and you can believe that or not. I wanted, the only reason for making that comment was that you would know that if I have an education, then I'm going to, re I'm going to definitely promote education for our children. And I believe in education, not saying that people who don't go to the secondary or, uh, or, or college doesn't believe in education because most people want better for their children than they had. So I'm a little insulted that somebody keeps bringing it up that I said we have an education. Of course you have an education. But uh, I had my reason for bringing those uh, comments forward. And I made the comment simply to justify that we have the ability to uh, look at the information that we're given, to do our own research, to talk to people, and make our own decisions. Thank you. Anyone else? OK, with that, uh, reports from board committees. Any reports from board committees? Yes, we, I would like to encourage, I'm oh, sorry about that. Uh, we've been um, providing the ability for the community to do a survey in regards to um, using personal self, devices. personal devices. Um, Ms. Patel chairs that committee and I co-chair with her. And we're coming to the end of our survey time. So we ask that if you would please um, go online and take that survey as a parent, as staff, as a student in regards to a personal electronic device being helpful in the education program here at District 150. If you do not have accessibility to the internet to do that, you may request um, written copy or hard copy from our public information officer, Mr. Copeland, and he will make sure that you get that information. We want to be able to bring a summary of that data before uh, when we conclude this year's mm -hmm. uh, advisory committee meeting to let you know if this is something that the district needs to continue to move forward in. Um, and then to get an idea, to yeah. get a baseline at what age our children are getting cell phones, iPads, laptops, how many of our children have them, um, where, at what schools there's high home internet accessibility and what schools there's not, so that as we do move into using more and more technology, we have a better idea of what our students have available and what our community and our parents think is appropriate for their children and what our teachers find helpful and not helpful in the classroom. And for so. those attending the parent university for April, we again will make available areas where you can go and take that survey online. Any other reports? I believe that's it. Motion to adjourn? So moved. For adjourn. Something you guys should look at is 